All right. This morning, I'm here with a really big inspiration of mine, uh, Mr. John Kemp, who is the uh, founder of Advancing Eco Agriculture and also the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, which has been just a huge learning platform of mine. Um, John, welcome here this morning. Jono, thanks for having me on. Dude, it is my absolute pleasure. And so where are you speaking from this morning, John? Where in the world are you? I am in North America. Um, I'm actually about 20 miles south of Lake Erie, so in the Great Lakes snowbelt zone. So we have lots of um, high humidity, about 40 inches of rainfall a year during uh, total water accumulation, and about a third of that comes as snow during the winter months. So we get lots of the white stuff here. Wow. Wow. And um, although my geographical knowledge of, of uh, the States is very uh, minimal, you, you paint a very, yeah, a very challenging picture. Well, we have lots of, uh, if we don't manage it well, we have lots of disease pressure and lots of insect pressure that uh, comes about as a result of that environment. Because with the higher humidity, higher rainfall, we also have fairly high temperatures during the summer months. Well, perhaps not as high as Australia or some of those environments, but still the humidity can be pretty intense. And uh, yeah, it's a perfect Petri dish for diseases. Yeah. Yeah. So healthy plants and a bit of resilience is, is pretty important. Yeah. Well, if you want to manage crops profitably and be economically viable, then uh, it becomes difficult very quickly to justify the 1500 to 3000 US dollars per acre that a lot of growers are spending on pesticides. That's, I mean, there's variability from crop to crop, of course, but um, for high value fruit and vegetable crops, which is the space that I grew up in, pesticide budgets are usually counted in the thousands of dollars per acre, not in the hundreds. That's the same deal here in New Zealand, man. A lot of, lot of symptom treatments, um, are actually just that which is keeping farmers on those same treatments and certainly I'm sure is the case over there as well. Ultimately I think what really started me down the pathway of regenerative agriculture was on the farm that I grew up on my dad was the pesticide distributor who were the first people to try all the newest latest and greatest cocktails and what was interesting is that over the decade or so that we were using pesticides, the more pesticides we used, the worse the problems became. So uh, you could solve a problem in a current year, but next year you would have the same disease or the same insect, and it would be significantly worse than in the past. And this pattern just kept continuing and kept continuing. When we started making the transition to try to manage these various diseases and insects by enhancing plant immune systems and by managing nutrition differently, all of a sudden our pesticide use started dropping um, 60, 70 percent. By 2006, we went completely pesticide free, and it's been really—it was really interesting. The fewer pesticides we used, the fewer we needed them. So they're essentially like. A drug addiction from my perspective the more of them you use the more you are dependent on them yeah there's actually a lot of interesting science behind this which is that when you have when you spray pesticides onto a crop you actually change that crop's biochemistry and you change its physiology and you change it from what is called a, a state of being in protein synthesis mode producing complete having the capacity to produce complete proteins to proteolysis mode or protein breakdown. And you actually create disease and insect susceptibility after a pesticide application. So it's not just hyperbole to say that the more of them you use, the more of them you need. It's an actual scientific fact that the more pesticides you spray, the more susceptible your crops are to diseases and insects in the future. You have a, <clears throat> a much better way of, of articulating me saying that the more you use, the, the more you need. <laughs> you become addicted. Your crops become addicted. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lag too, right? Like you can't just, you can't, well, maybe you did just stop, but my experience is, you know, there is a, there is certainly a weeding off program required. We, our weaning off period on the farm that I grew up on was one year. We went from being the most intense pesticide users in the region in 2003 to being, or no, in 2004, to using zero pesticides in 2006. So 2005 was our transition year. In 2006, we just stopped cold turkey. 
And as in our consulting work today, uh, we, we generally make the recommendation to growers that they have to earn the right to discontinue the use of pesticides because we're working in many cases with crops that are worth tens of thousands of dollars per acre. And uh, it's not wise to make a recommendation that costs a grower a crop or a lot of money. We are in this game and doing the work we're doing to help growers be more profitable and be more financially successful. And so we seldom make the recommendation to uh, just eliminate all pesticide applications right from the get-go. However, we have worked with a few farmers who have expressed the desire to do so and have done so over the years on a number of different crops, and I have been really impressed with their success. There is something magical about truly investing your generating soils and crop health quickly and discontinuing pesticide applications all at once. Um, if you are working with a crop type that you're able to make that shift, there is an incredibly rapid regeneration that can happen very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's certainly times where I've found that you can, you know, completely pull the pin um, from, from fertilizer applications and chemical use. And that's when you're starting with, um, for instance, a new cover crop, you know, brand new seed starting it the way that you intend it to carry on its life. It's, it's, it's those situations where, you know, we aren't so reliant, you know, with the new life coming in, but, um, well, and, and, there's still guys out there that have gone out and I, and I do take my head off to them and thankfully it's not been under my advice because I, like you, don't do that. Uh, advise people to completely pull the pin. But there has been people like a, a great mentor of mine, um, Peter Barrett at Lindburn Station in New Zealand here. He completely pulled the pin on 9,500 hectares um, just, just when he decided that that was it um, as far as synthetic fertilizer applications go. And uh, there was some discomfort and some some uncertainty associated with that. But, you know, it's, there's nothing like a, a good challenge and, and, you know, rather than dipping the toe and jumping off um, to, to, to make you learn how to swim. Well, what I can say is on, on my podcast, one of the first guests that I interviewed was um, Michael McNeil, who's been a mentor of mine. And he has been an advisor for about 150,000 acres in the Midwest, in uh, Iowa, Minnesota, Corn Belt country that he has helped to transition cold turkey, just pulling the plug as you described it, going from the intense pesticide applications to zero pesticide applications in a single year. And um, that, here's an agronomist with 45 years of experience who has helped a lot of farmers do this successfully. And uh, it certainly seems like a very scary idea. And yet, you can't really argue with success, but that success is coming about as a result of a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, and being very, um, being very smart about how and why we're making the transition and understanding the alternatives, understanding that if you don't manage pests with pesticide applications, then you need to manage nutrition differently and being proactive in nutrition management, I think is where it really comes down to. So, in your case, John, you, you talked about your father being someone who, you know, was responsible for distributing um, pesticides, etc. What was it for you that sort of struck your interest or started your inquiry into this different, you know, not so much different, but, but new way of viewing plant health and was the idea of soil biology brand new at that time or, or had you had some introduction prior to your inquiry? We started growing vegetables commercially in 1994 and in 1999 my dad became the local distributor for all of the inputs, seeds, fertilizers, equipment, pesticides and so forth and from that point forward, we were the first people to try all the newest products and then make recommendations to our customers on how well they were working for us on our farm. And at this point, we were growing uh, our four primary crops, our zucchini, cucumbers, cantaloupe, and tomatoes. And if you'll notice, three out of those four crops are cucurbit crops. So we, are, we have a fairly small land base. We're farming very intensely. And we are growing cover crops 
every month or every winter during the winter months, but all of our soil is still in vegetables every year, year after year, and still getting the intense pesticide applications. So we were generally at a very high level, we were familiar with the idea of biology and we knew the value and the importance of earthworms, but um, we felt that controlling diseases was more important. And then in the early 2000s, 2002, three and four, we had three consecutive years of high humidity, high rainfall, very difficult to control various different diseases. And we ended up losing greater than 70% of all of our primary crops three consecutive years. So this was very difficult for the farm economically. Uh, we, were, we had to tighten our belts very significantly to make it through that period. And I was becoming very frustrated with the lack of performance, the lack of results we were getting from pesticide applications. We were putting on ever in more intense pesticides and insecticides, and we still had pressure, even in the same year. It got to the point where in 2003, I told my dad that uh, we might as well do nothing for nothing as do something for nothing, because it appeared we were putting on the pesticide applications for nothing. Then in 2004, we had an experience that was really the light bulb moment for me. We started renting a field from a neighboring farm that bordered right up against one of our own fields. And so this neighboring field had been managed by a dairy farm and it had been in a corn, small grain, and hay rotation without the intense pesticide applications. So they were applying dairy manure and applying limestone and, and managing the soil differently than we were. In 2004, the, so now there are these two fields side by side. We planted cantaloupe across the field border. And on the soil that we had been farming for the past decade with the intense pesticide applications, at harvest time, 80% of the leaves were infected with powdery mildew to the point where it almost cost us the crop. And on the new soil, there was no powdery mildew. There was not even 5% or 10% leaf infection. There was zero. It was so pronounced, there was this knife line right down through the center of the field. And in fact, it was so pronounced that these plants that were planted um, two feet apart were not quite a meter apart. There were vines, healthy vines, growing right in amongst the diseased vines, and they had no disease. And wow. that was, it was the same variety. It was planted the same day. It was managed in the same way, except it was planted onto different soil. And that was the light bulb moment for me. I wanted to know what are the differences between these two plants and what allows one cantaloupe plant to be resistant to powdery mildew when the next plant half a meter away is susceptible? Mm. Yeah. And so, so at that moment you're thinking, wow, how do I, dis <laughs> how do I discover what's caused this? You know, obviously there was some, some history there, but you know, where did you go? Was it, was, was the internet a big part of that? Uh, no, I had no access to the internet at that point. Um, it was exclusively phone calls in the library. And I was uh, very fortunate to have a local library that um, was very helpful and very supportive. They got all kinds of scientific textbooks through interlibrary loan from all over the world. Uh, I still remember getting some of Fritz Albert Pop's work from Germany. Um, so they did really incredible of getting me all kinds of information. And then where it started really was um, on the phone. I started talking to people and I began talking to people and asking questions about plant immunity and asking questions about this specific situation. I, I focused intently on this one question, what allows one plant to be susceptible when the second plant is resistant? And I soon discovered that uh, there were not very many people who were able to answer that question. Uh, most of the people who were able to answer those questions often had some connections to biological warfare. It was a really interesting uh, military connections that uh, came about as a result of those conversations. But um, over, I was very blessed and very fortunate over the next six months to develop a network of really amazing mentors who guided my studying and my learning and said, well, you should read these books and read these articles. And 
So I, um, I developed a great network. I've read tens of thousands of articles and thousands of books and uh, still read a lot and talk to a lot of people. I believe that the quality of the information that we find when we go looking for something is only as good as the questions that we ask. And one of the skills that I have actively tried to cultivate is becoming better at asking the right questions or asking better questions. And so one of my questions that I ask myself all the time is, what is the question I should be asking? What's the question I should be thinking about? It's a big question, John. <laughs> I like those questions. And yeah, do you have like an underlying question that's always there for you? Like my one is, and it's there for me every day, and I, I don't have the answer for it, and it's one that's not intended to be answered, but it's how do I create a world that works for everyone aligned with nature? That's a good question. Part of, the answer, part of the answer is that we co-create it with everyone else that is around us. Yeah. I believe that ultimately there is, I grew up in a cultural community that comes from a, a Judeo-Christian worldview background. And so I'll speak within that context, but I think the, the general message is true from any religious or cultural context. Uh, I believe that what we intend and what we imagine is what we create, and also what we intend is what we become. So within the Judeo-Christian worldview, if we believe that, if we truly believe that we are the sons and daughters of God, I believe that Creation is not something that happened just at one moment in time in the beginning. Creation is something that happens new each moment. And as the sons and daughters of God, we are here to co-create reality. And we can create the reality in the future that we desire with, based on what we intend the outcomes to be. So, if we truly embrace that and truly believe that, then there are no limits to, to the good that we can create in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people talk about, oh, I'm, I'm just waiting for this to happen or, you know, when, when, when this happens, then I'll, then I'll, then I'll go and do that, that which I've always, you know, dreamed of doing or what, whatever game you're in, you know, there's always these things that, that uh, you know seem like that they're, they're too big or too out of reach or too far away or too crazy, you know, like what we're talking about, you know, here thus far to do with you know biological agriculture was to me at one point a completely absurd concept because I hadn't created it, I hadn't imagined it, and do you think that you know imagination and curiosity is the start of creation? I believe that yes imagination and um, I'll use the word dreaming imagination and dreaming is the start of creation and in fact I would say not only is it the beginning it's by far the most important piece and this is if we want to create change in the world if we want to create change not just for ourselves but for other people the most powerful thing we can do is to create a clear image in other people's mind of what the future reality could possibly look like. If we paint an image of what is possible, what the potential is, what can be achieved, once that image becomes really clear in people's minds, then it will happen. The most powerful thing we can do is to inspire the imagination. So one of the mantras that I have um, used for myself over the years is uh, one of the things that I'm here for is to bring inspiration to the point of action because you can only have action once you have a very clear image in your imagination. So I believe that creating the dream, if you will, creating or inspiring the imagination is the most important work. It should seem really uncanny that, that you would be my first guest on the Plant a Seed podcast. <laughs> well, uh, you, 
You started, you started with creating an image of a podcast and uh, you know, with um, creating an image of what it is or a dream of what it is that you want to see. And I'll add one more thought, which is a quote from Peter Diamandis that I really like. He says, the best way to accurately predict the future is to create it yourself. So to the point that you were making at the beginning of your comment about uh, oh, once this is a certain way I want to do that or once that is a certain way I want to do this, just create that reality. Yeah. And then, and then beyond the creating it within your own head, like that's no use to anyone, you need to go out there and share it with the world because then you're responsible for that, that creation. You know, otherwise it's just an idea and I don't know about you, but to me, ideas are only as good as the person communicating them. If it's not communicated, then how does the world know about it? It needs to be communicated and it also needs to be acted upon. And the reality is that there are many, many good ideas in the world that uh, were never fully brought to fruition. And uh, for any number of different reasons, but uh, I've, in my own experience, working with the really incredible team of people we have at AEA, uh, we will come up with several dozen awesome ideas every day that say, oh, this is a great idea. We should go do this. This is a great idea. We should go do that. We talk about it and we never do it because we are so busy. We have so much going on and those ideas never happen. But, and this used to really frustrate me. I, just, I used to find this annoying. Oh, we had this great idea, but we never did it. But I learned something. I learned that the very best ideas out of those dozen ideas we would have every day, there would be several every week that were just incredible. And guess what? Those ideas got done because they were so good. They were so inspiring that the people didn't wait for permission. They didn't wait for approval. They just did them. They just implemented them. And so I think that is a uh, one of the values of exercising that idea muscle of constantly coming up with new ideas and talking about new ideas and, and being fully comfortable with the fact that not all of them will be birthed and uh, will become reality, but the best ones will. And just on that too, John, <clears throat> you know, a, a lot of what stops people talking about ideas that they have is like fear of not being accepted or like fear of being shut down or fear of being ridiculed for that idea. Was that something that you ever come across in your early days of, of, you know, creating these, these new ideas? Was that something that came up for you or was it not just not a thing for you? Um, I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to my parents for this because it was never that significant for me. And it was not that significant because um, because of some of the cultural context, my family and my parents were always a little bit ostracized within their community. And so we grew up, I grew up in a family where that was okay. It was, uh, it was okay to be an outlier. It was okay to be at the fringe. And not only was it okay, but within, my parents were both innovators. Um, my father was the first grower in the region to begin uh, to shift away from commodity crops and to begin growing high value fruit and vegetable crops. And he was ostracized within the community for that initially. Um, he, he did a number, did a number of innovative business things that, um, were not popular with the family, with his extended family, with his parents and his in-laws and, he was willing to step out and be the pioneer. Uh, and the same was true of my mother as well. She was very supportive uh, in that process and also actively helped with that process. And so as children, we were always given permission to ask the question, why? And to challenge the status quo. Why are we doing this this way? Why are we doing that way? And we also, as a result of being a little bit ostracized in the community, we became comfortable in that zone. And so one of, the, uh, one of the book titles that made me laugh the moment I read it was uh, a book authored by Richard Feynman. 
and the title was why would you care what other people think and i think uh, you are absolutely correct in that social permission and uh, being concerned about what people think within our community within our church uh, at the coffee shop our families and so forth is what holds a lot of us back um, and even even in the with the unique environment that I grew up in, it is still something that um, is uncomfortable at times, uh, very uncomfortable. But um, it's something that I I actually when I recognized this about a decade or so ago, um, I wrote a note and taped it on my wall that uh, asked the question: Is this someone whose opinion I chose to care about? And uh, I, may, I started making very deliberate choices to saying, okay, this person is someone whose opinion I respect and I care about their opinion about my work. And then there were other people whose opinion I deliberately chose not to care about. Not that I didn't respect them as a person, but I chose to not care about their opinion of my work and what I was doing and who I was as a person. Mm -hmm. Which is a big part of it all. That's that's <clears throat> what's underneath this, the fear is, you know, fear of of not looking good as a as an individual. You know, what if what if they discover, you know, I'm not this person I make myself out to be, or what if, um, you know, what if this idea brings about a whole lot of um, like for me, it was when I discovered this this new way of of being in the world where I communicate fully and I, I talk about what's there for me and I express myself. And, um, when I viewed the world in that way of, of, you know, a fully connected, you know, massive, massive, essentially an organism that relies on expression and communication, the identity that I'd created up for myself from the age of about 15 to 27 was one where I do it all and i was the tough guy and so had to be staunch and as a result of that i was very lonely and mm -hmm. as a result of that everything was really hard work and then i began to thrive off the hard work like it was something to be proud of and then of course pride became a big part of it and then another thing that came up for me was the new stuff that i'm learning doesn't line up with that identity. When I started to create, when I started to innovate, when I started to express myself, I had to let go of something. You know, I really had to let go of something. And dude, that was not comfortable. But, well, and, <laughs> and it completely changed my life. And to hear you share about your experience as a child from your parents' point of view, when I realized that being that way and, and at the time, my, my daughter was four and my son was, he was almost two. I realized that I wasn't exactly setting the bar for what a role model should be teaching their children or a father should be teaching their children. I was, I was basically setting my children up to be uh, withdrawn and, and, and suppressed and angry and lonely. And so... <laughs> what i'm what i'm what's there for me right now is over the last two years i've developed relationships in my life you know i'm sitting here talking to john kemp for, you know i've right now i've got the most amazing people in my life and that wasn't possible with that old identity that i'd created and you know thank goodness that i that i did change um well not that i that, that i changed but that i discovered and realized that that wasn't something that needed to stay, you know, like we can, we can create, you talk about creation and, and, and creating your future. Well, you can also create who you are because that's the catalyst of all of that you create. You create that whether it's intentional or not. The reality is uh, if you, if you want to know what someone's inner life is like, it's actually very easy. And it's a bit scary to say this because it is, it is an idea that um, sometimes can produce a very harsh reaction. 
but it's very easy to tell what someone's inner life is like. You just look at what their outer life is like because the outer is always a perfect reflection of the inner world. So are you, are you bringing um, sickness and disease into your life? What is it within you that is creating that reality? When we accept, as you just described, that we are completely responsible for everything that we create in our life and bring about in our life, it gives us a completely different perspective on how we play the game of life, so to speak, to use that term. And the story, the personal story that you shared, I can relate with very uh, very well as well, because I also went through a period where um, I needed to be the strong one and to be invulnerable. And um, I had to get past that and had to resolve that and had to be able to be vulnerable before you can begin really connecting deeply with people, connecting deeply with people and moving to, I'll use the phrase, moving to a higher level of consciousness. Uh, it's not that. It's not that, I don't like particularly like the phrase higher or lower, but I think there are different levels of consciousness where sometimes people um, come from a place of fear versus a place of love. And uh, when you come from a different place within, you create a very different reality around yourself. And uh, I'll just, I'll share one more thought on this because this is also something that has been very meaningful for me. Um, is uh, Otto Scharmer's work on Theory U at MIT. He was studying organizational development, organizational leadership, and how is it that some leaders and some people are able to inspire their organization to produce extraordinary outcomes and to move and to embrace the future consistently year after year. And he discovered something very interesting. It's it's a lot more nuanced. It's a bit like trying to explain holistic management in, in one paragraph. It's not particularly easy because there's lots of uh, aspects to it. But the one sentence that he said that had really hit home for me, the outcome of an intervention has nothing to do with the skills of the intervener. It has everything to do with the place within from which the intervener comes. When you sit with that phrase, and you just contemplate it for a while, you realize that almost everything we do in our life, every time we, we have an exchange or a dialogue with another person, or we try to bring about changes in the landscape, that is an intervention. If we try to convince our child to do something a little bit differently, that's an intervention. When we try to uh, persuade our spouse to make a decision differently, that's an intervention. So many of our conversations are interventions. And the reality is that the outcome of those conversations has nothing to do with how persuasive we are or how convincing we are. The outcome is dependent on the place that we come from within. Do we deeply care about this other person? And do we have a deep love for them? And can they sense that we have their best interest at heart? When that comes through very clearly, facilitating change is easy. Mm. That is two things there, man. One, you talked about um, intervention. And, and a lot of that is intervening, you know, yourself, getting yourself out of the way or stopping your own, you know, there's a lot of... Um, I call it self-sabotage. You know, a lot of that sort of inner dialogue stuff that creates action that 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 deters, you know, changes because it's so uncomfortable that our, our identity just holds on to it for dear life. And so all of a sudden you're subconsciously, you know, it's like people that all of a sudden decide to to change their eating habits or to lose weight or do something really drastic like that. You know, they're really up against themselves. It really is an intervention on yourself. And going you know in farming it's a it's a massive one we're used to doing it something a certain way and how you talked about um and and how you talked about had to had to get to know what's going on within somebody or, or what's underneath it all is to look at how they are on the outside and isn't it profound that um you know and this is my experience i'm talking to here when i was controlling and manipulating nature 
to get results, I found that that was rippling out into my relationships. I was deceitful. I was manipulative. I was generating agreement from others to back up my, my ideas and my righteousness. And it was really hard work. And then, and then of course that rolled out into my way of being in the world where, where um, I had to do everything and I couldn't accept help from anyone else. And so I was massively susceptible to things like, like I was always crook. I always had like a cough and a cold and I was always really, really quite down and grumpy. And it's like a great big vicious cycle that requires some, some interruption or some, some intervention. And for me, it was, you know, sadly is what it took was, you know, I, I had to hit the wall. I had to have my, 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 um, partner at the time my wife of 10 years left and that was what started my inquiry you know that was the initial like like a whack you know like all right there's something's you know not working here and it still wasn't a, until about a year later that I started to get curious about what was going on beneath my feet and that discovery of biology and, and ecosystem function it wasn't till about I don't know, maybe six months into that inquiry that I realized it is no different to how we are as human beings. Yeah. That's an, inc that's an incredible example. And uh, I can tell it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a very personal example, but uh, yes, I agree very strongly with what you expressed that um, the physical, the, the physical reality that is in our life, the environment that we're in, the relationships that we have, the way people interact with us, those are things that we create, might be completely subconscious, but those are realities that we create. And uh, when you begin approaching them consciously, you can produce and bring about an, and bring about an intervention, as you described, to bring about this shift. You know, I've, I've been hosting the podcast now for, I think it's almost three years. And I have so much fun with it because I get to have conversations with amazing people who say some of the most incredible things. After every conversation, I get up and do a fist pump and jump up and down in the air. Literally, I do that because I'm so excited about the great information that people have shared. And as now that the podcast has been several years old, I've started paying attention to what are the episodes that are really popular? What are the conversations that people really enjoyed? And what I discovered is that it was not the conversations where people were the most knowledgeable or shared the most technical information. It was the conversations where people really shared their heart. And sometimes the information they shared was very harsh and very blunt. But because they came from that right place within, their message was able to be heard and to be felt by other people. The, the one example is um, Michael McNeil that I mentioned earlier. So I think he was, uh, he was somewhere in the first five episodes that we did. And then I again had him back on a year later. And so in the first episode, uh, the first time I interviewed Michael, he said some sentences that were very harsh and very blunt, impossible to misinterpret. Sentences like, stop poisoning your land. I know that depending on who would have said that sentence, people would have tuned out anything for that he had to say. They would not, not have listened to the rest of that episode. But they could feel that Michael cared deeply about them. He cares deeply about farmers. He cares deeply about agriculture. He has this very strong empathy and heart connection. And so because he was coming from a place within of love and caring, they were able to hear that message and connect with it. Mm, it's, like a, it's like a ruthless compassion that's sometimes really required. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, man, like it's, um, it's, and you know, like it, what I, what I'm sort of, what's coming up for me just right this second is, um, is how 
I was so scared of taking responsibility and, and, you know, for, for the majority of my adult life. Um, and it was that, that was causing the, I won't say problems, but that, that was really rippling out into, into everything in life was my, my inauthenticity, my, my avoidance of taking responsibility for, for who I wanted to be in life. And what was underneath it all was, was I really just wanted to be loved and, and I wanted to love, but my identity wouldn't allow that, you know, like my, the, being the tough guy, you can't go around telling people how much you love them, nor do you allow yourself to accept love because it's like this, you know, thing that isn't, you know, strong or, and, and like, I look at it like this, man. It's like um, plants that don't take responsibility for uh, supporting those around them so that those around them can support them, you know, whether it be the microbial community or above ground, you know, biodiversity. It's, it's that for that plant, they are massively, massively susceptible. If they want to make it all about them, it's not going to be, you know, the, the power of diversity is no good to anyone if it's all about me, me, me. And so it's all about me, me, me. It's those plants who don't survive. Yeah. Those are the plants who do not survive. It's the, I think the word that you were looking for earlier is dissonance. When you, when you are not in alignment with, um, with your, when, when, um, what's the words that I'm looking for? Um, essentially when you are creating a reality where you are bringing illness into your life let's say or where you are um, not able to develop deep relationships that is a signal that you are at dissonance internally and um, you're not really aligned with your true self with your higher self mm. yeah yeah and that you can create that to be you know like it people talk about finding themselves Maybe it's not so much about finding yourself. Maybe it's about creating yourself. Is there a difference? Well, finding means that, oh man, you've just, I've just realized like finding would mean that it's already there, but maybe, maybe, you know, you have always been there or for me, maybe, maybe I have always been there. I just haven't allowed myself to be. When, when an artist creates a statue out of a block of stone, was the statue always there? Or did he find it? Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much coming up for me right now, John. This is crazy. And so when did you, when did you discover your, you know, like, was there a time for you that, that, that you discovered yourself or, or was there a, where am I going with this? For me, it was a, it was really clear. Like it only happened not even three years ago when I started to allow myself to be, you know, just be and, and not pretend and not, not suppress. And every, you know, every day, every, every, I'm just, continuously learning stuff about myself and it's and and as a result of that things just tend to work and so yeah. was there was there a time for you where where you know you went from like was there a time that you really discovered yourself john was there a time where you were like ah there there he is <laughs> uh, i would say on on my part it was more of a gradual process it didn't happen all at one moment in time it, there were there were different periods of, of um, dramatic realization, if you will, and uh, discovering a new facet and uncovering a new facet and kind of exploring and learning. Um, and that's, that's still ongoing. I, I don't think that ever stops entirely. Hopefully it never does. Um, and there is, there is still an element of where I don't fully express myself around some people that are important in my life for different reasons. And 
that's partially a, a result of the community, the Amish community that I grew up in, the culture that I grew up in and am still a part of. Um, actually largely due to that. And this is a culture and a community that I value tremendously. And I, I see the value that it brings to the world and, and the energy that they bring to the world. But uh, their interests are very different from my own. So I've chosen to remain a part of that community and to contribute to that community where I can and where I'm able to. And yet, uh, if you were to ask the neighbors around me and the people that I spend time with in a social setting, if you were to ask them what I do, they would say, oh, I think John is a fertilizer salesman. That's their answer. <laughs> and, and so there are people in life that uh, don't really know what I'm all about. And uh, I'm okay with that. But that means that there is an element of a group of people that I don't fully express who I really am with. Um, and so I just recognize that and acknowledge it for what it is and move on. And so just on that note, John, I'd like to ask you and for those of, that are listening that perhaps, you know, haven't listened to your podcast or really don't know, um, you know, what, what John Kempf is up to and, and, and who you are. Can you, can you tell us please in a few words, just, just, you know, who you are, what you're committed to. I mean, for me, it's clear. Um, and maybe there's maybe and likely there's a lot more to it, but I'd, can you can you go ahead and just just tell us what what you're up to? Who what are you committed to? What I'm, really, what I'm really passionate about. My personal mission is to have regenerative agriculture become the mainstream globally in the next 20 years by 2040, where it becomes the status quo that everything else is compared to. And what that means to me, when I think about regenerative agriculture, I think about an agriculture that regenerates soil health so that there is no need for external inputs. It regenerates plant health so that plants are completely resistant to diseases and insects. It regenerates farm economics and profitability where farmers are really profitable and can be very successful financially. And lastly, it regenerates public health. Well, actually, there's one more, and that it, it regenerates ecology. It regenerates the landscape outside of just the farm and the crops itself, but it regenerates the broader ecology. But then when we speak about regenerating public health, when we grow plants that are so healthy, they have such a robust immune system that they are resistant to diseases and insects, they also transfer that immunity to the people who consume them as food, and we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. That, to me, is the vision that I have for regenerative agriculture. And so to bring about that vision, to achieve those outcomes, uh, I'm involved in a number of different things. I founded a company called Advancing Eco Agriculture back in 2006, which started originally as a consulting company uh, consulting on plant nutrition and cultural management practices to produce plants that were resistant to diseases and insects by managing nutrition differently and eliminating the need for pesticides. That company shifted then in 2012 to also become a nutritional supplements company. So uh, we also have biological inoculants and molybdenum and selenium and cobalt, some of the trace minerals and so forth that are more difficult for farmers to access. So we're not we're not mainstream um, fertilizers or plant nutrition, but instead focusing specifically on what are, what are the vitamins that plants require to be resistant to disease and insects, if you want to frame it in that way. What are the trace minerals and what are the nutritional supplements that are required to achieve that, the degree of disease and insect resistance that I'm speaking about. So then in addition to advancing eco-agriculture, uh, I also co-founded a virtual laboratory called Crop Health Labs. Um, we also took our technology into the cannabis space with a company called Ozadia. And um, I started hosting the Regenerative Agriculture podcast, which uh, I think is now one of the more popular podcasts in the agricultural space in general, which is uh, quite an honor. Um, I founded um, Regenerative Agriculture Academy, which is, uh, I. I also teach 
a lot of webinars and uh, a couple times a month during the winter months and then once a month during the summer that people can um, sign up to. So we have a lot of recorded webinars and the podcasts on YouTube uh, and everything else. But then in addition, I realized that for a lot of these topics and conversations, it was, there was more, we needed to go deeper than we could in just an introductory conversation on a webinar. So that led to the development of the academy, it's where instructors can teach in-depth courses online that anyone can access around the world. And um, let me see, I think there's a few other enterprises that I'm involved with as well, but you kind of get the essence of it. <laughs> there's, a, there's an underlying commitment there. It's, it's really about democratizing and digitizing information. How can we share information and make it accessible globally uh, make it accessible to the agronomists, the advisors, the farmers who are farming who are farming 40,000 hectares, and to the farmers in Africa who are producing a quarter hectare of maize for their family. Um, if we want regenerative agriculture to become the global mainstream in the next two decades, it needs to be equally accessible and practical and be able to be implemented by all of those people. And so this is actually, it's really, this is an important point. In, in our work at Advancing Eco Agriculture, uh, we recognize that as a company, we can't be all things to all people, nor do we desire to be. We have no desire to be the Bayer Monsanto of regenerative agriculture. That's not uh, a goal that we aspire to. But what we do aspire to is to set such an extraordinary high level of excellence to set such a high bar for the quality of our agronomic information and for our results that other companies will be forced to change the way they do business as a result of our presence in the marketplace. And that has already uh, happened and is happening. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, it, 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 feels, uh, it can feel a bit threatening when other large companies begin imitating us. But at the same time, that's the reality that we set out to create. Mm -hmm. So, um, our, I believe one of the foundational reasons for our rapid growth and the reputation that we enjoy in the space as a company is that when we approach mainstream growers who um, are not familiar with regenerative agriculture practices, we don't have a conversation with them about, uh, eliminating pesticides or about eliminating fertilizers or about um, growing healthy food for people or regenerating soil health. Those are all secondary outcomes. What we focus on very intensely, far farmers have been financially and economically challenged and suppressed from every direction for decades globally, ever since a cheap food policy has become the policy for many significant organizations around the world or significant governments, significant countries around the world for decades. And farmers have been receiving the short end of that stick. And so our message is very simple and very straightforward. We help you be more profitable and make more money by managing plant nutrition differently than the way you're managing it right now. That's it, that's what we focus on. How can we increase marketable yields? What are, the, what are the crop characteristics that increase marketable yield? Is it fiber length and thickness? Is it um, grain size? Is it the number of kernels? What exactly are the crop characteristics that will give you an increased yield and quality that you actually get paid for? We focus on that and we manage nutrition differently to produce different outcomes and then all these other pieces happen by themselves. They're secondary. Mm. I'm sure there's many, many, many different ways of going about that. Uh, there's a different way for every crop and every farmer <laughs> and every farm. Everything is in, in agriculture and as farmers, all of us know this, everything is context dependent. What mm -hmm. works on one operation needs to be adapted and revised before it can work on the next operation a quarter mile down the road. There are no universe.
Right, John, I might have just lost you there. You still there, John? I am. You're coming back now. You're coming back now. There we go. I forgot you there, John. Yep, I'm here. I can hear you. Cool. Maybe shut cool. the video off. Yeah, I lost you for just a second. So I that I think I've got you. Yep. Yeah, I got you loud and clear. So we were just sort of finishing up about um, what AEA has to offer. And what really excited me was the idea of you. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting concept. Um, and I'm going to term it um, marketplace leadership. And, and I'm hearing that, you know, you setting the bar or setting the standard such that, you know, others are, you use the word force, but probably it's, probably it's, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say it is just leadership. Um, it's like people, people discover something new in the market, like it's happening here in New Zealand. Um, and, and all of a sudden there's a, there's a want for something that didn't exist before. And then the, the market starts to identify that, that new trend or that new direction of interest. And all of a sudden people are like, right, how do I mimic this? And it is scary. Like I'm finding it really scary. You know, there's people that are, that are mimicking um, what, you know, certainly what I do. And uh, there's people ridiculing what I do with, with much more resources than what I have. And there's also a sense of freedom and, and, and satisfaction to that too, because that means that I'm being effective. Yes, it does. And um, ultimately, when I, when I spoke about forcing change in the marketplace and, and forcing people to adapt, um, there, there is no, we desire people to change. We desire people to adapt. So, uh, it's not really a perspective of uh, we're we're not we don't need to force them as long as they are willing, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> so applies to so many different things. <laughs> what um, what I meant? Um, did you catch my comments about our emphasis on financial performance? No, no. Please, please um, repeat that, please. Yeah, this is such an important point. When we communicate with growers, we don't have a conversation with them about improving soil health or about growing food as medicine or eliminating pesticides or eliminating fertilizer applications. Instead, we focus exclusively on a conversation about improving economics and improving, improving financial performance. Our message, our marketing message is very simple. If you go to our website, it's the tagline that's right on the homepage. That says we help farmers make more money and be more profitable by managing plant nutrition differently. That's it. When you do that, then all of these other pieces, soil health, uh, improved plant health, uh, if you do it properly, all these other pieces are simply a result. So we focus very intently when we begin working with a farm of understanding what are, uh, what exactly defines paid marketable yield for a specific crop in a given environment? Is it kernel size and test weight? Is it protein content? Is it fiber length? What exactly is it for that crop? And how can we manage nutrition at specific stages of plant development to influence those yield characteristics and help the producers make more money? And as a result of focusing on that very intensely, I think this is one area where um, Regenerative agriculture, the, the regenerative agriculture narrative as it is developing and growing today needs to be very cautious. We do not want to communicate a message to say that uh, you need to begin incorporating livestock and growing cover crops and doing these things in anticipation of some future financial reward and improved performance five years down the road. That is okay as far as it goes, but many, most growers that we work with don't have the luxury of five years. They don't have the luxury of time. We need to show immediate economic performance the first year that we work with a grower. 
So we have focused on this very intensely. And what happens when we begin, when growers invite us to begin working in a local region, uh, we've had this experience. I'm actually, we had a field day today in Texas on cotton uh, that I was not present for, but heard lots of good things about it. I'm very excited about what is happening. Last year was the first year that we worked on cotton had no previous experience. We might have had a few growers that use some of our products, but we weren't doing any in-depth agronomic consulting on cotton. We learned a lot last year, and even in spite of having no experience, we learned that the nutrition management of cotton is so badly screwed up from the mainstream perspective that it's very easy to produce. I mean, in our first year, we produce profitability and economic responses on every acre that we work with, even though we had no historical experience. This is now our second year. And uh, our field day today was on a farm in, um, actually I said Texas, but I misspoke, it was actually in Arizona. Or actually, no, it was in Texas today. It was in Arizona a couple days ago. We had another field day. Um, and, the, and the Arizona grower had, um, was farming about 7,000 acres altogether. His historical cotton average, he's been farming for several decades, his historical cotton average is about four and a half to five and a half bales per acre. The best that they've ever done in the region is seven bales per acre. They're on track to harvest 11 bales per acre this year. What? Yes. So when we talk about forcing change, that will force change. That pricks cotton is. <laughs> cotton nutrition will never be managed the same in that region of that i'm certain wow wow and so because that's of, because it's not managed will not be managed the same in that region uh, i actually haven't had the chance to look this up i wanted to look it up but i i'm guessing that at 11 bales per acre we must be approaching the the uh world record for that if not exceeding it and wow. so that means that the change we've been able to produce there will replicate. It's going to spread to other cotton growing regions, first in North America and then around the world. It's only a matter of time because now that cotton grower, and though it's not one grower, but there's a whole group of growers um, throughout Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas that are experiencing these results. It now means that these growers are the low cost producers. They are putting in the lowest number of inputs, uh, we cut their pesticide bills, their insecticide and fungicide and the PGR applications by 80%. So there's <laughs> this dramatic cost, uh, or cost reduction. We've increased their profitability. Now these growers become the low cost producer and they can be profitable. And That's other growers from around the world now have to compete with them. Wow. The bottom line I think this is really important, is I believe to have regenerative agriculture become mainstream, we need to emphasize the economics message. message. If you want to inspire change, the reality is that you achieve what you incentivize. And when we can communicate to farmers that there is a strong economic incentive to managing differently, and they can make more money, significantly more money, and be significantly more profitable, that will be the conversation that will actually provide inspiration to the point of action. Yes, we need the agronomic knowledge to go with that. It's much more knowledge intensive rather than input intensive. It is much more management intensive. But if you can increase your profitability by four or five X, that's easily worth it. Mm. And the ripple effect of that, you know, discovery, it's the sort of thing, you watch a good movie, you can't help but tell all your friends and family about it. So, of course, this guy, 11 bales, he's going to be telling all his friends and family the difference you've made just not only on that property, but in that community is going to be huge. Absolutely. And this is now our second year of producing these types of results on cotton. Um, we keep learning more every year. And every year is different, but it's, uh, we're confident that it's not a fluke because I gave, I reported the results on one farm, but we're working on several dozen farms across a pretty broad region. 
we're going to do the same thing again next year and again the year after that. And uh, it just keeps growing. Wow. So on that note, John, of, of you know, what you're committed to and, and, and rolling, you know, what you're committed to out to the world and making it scalable and accessible um, might be a good time to share um, your, your latest uh, innovation. <laughs> a project that I'm really excited about um, is called Kind Harvest. And uh, by the time this conversation gets posted online, you'll be able to find it online at kindharvest.ag. And um, the, what I have learned over the years is that the most powerful way for us to facilitate change in the agricultural landscape, um, I mentioned earlier that this approach to regenerative agriculture is more knowledge intensive. And what I have observed is that it is those growers who embrace learning that are the most successful. And I've constantly been thinking about how can we facilitate the exchange of information and have people have us for us as growers to learn from each other better. Because we have many amazing instructors uh, and many mentors, ranging from Terry McCosker to Christine Jones to um, here in, in North America, we have Jerry Hatfield. In France, we have Olivier Hussan. There are, there are many very wise mentors and researchers and scientists who we need, whose support and knowledge and information and whose wisdom we need. But what is really the most valuable is when we learn how other people have implemented that knowledge on their operations. So learning amongst ourselves from farmer to farmer. And so the intent of Kind Harvest is to be a social networking platform that allows all of us to exchange ideas, to exchange knowledge and information without all of the noise and disruption that happens on today's social media platforms. So uh, we have Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp and uh, LinkedIn and all these, and there's a lot of good information that exchange that is happening there, but they're so noisy and we're constantly being distracted. And uh, they're also free because it is our attention that they are selling. So with Kind Harvest, we are disrupting this model entirely. Uh, it will be a paid subscription, but once you are there, it is a platform for farmers to exchange ideas and knowledge and information and to interact with each other and to interact with these scientists and mentors that can contribute to the conversation and help bring agriculture to a better place. And that is exciting. I'm really excited about it. There's, uh, I, I never imagined myself starting a project like this. If you would have asked me a year ago, it was an idea that had come up, one of the many ideas that uh, came up and then got uh, just ignored in the bin over time. And then I started discussing this idea with some of my mentors and colleagues and every person I spoke with said, that's an incredible idea, you, sh you need to do that. And uh, so that's been what I've been working on the next couple of months, uh, the last couple of months. We launch October 26th, and uh, I'm excited to see how it goes. It's going to be a lot of fun. And um, and I've been lucky enough to have a little sneak peek, and and it looks sexy. It look, I mean, you said you were going to sharpen it up a bit more yet, but even just as it is now, I can see it just being massively, massively appealing to you know farmers that are out there, maybe curious but don't know what the next step is. They're not on Facebook or social media, or even if they are, there's so much information out there. It's like information overload. And to hear how Kind Harvest is going to be categorized to suit people's interests, people can jump on and just really, you know, dial in what they're interested in and go straight to those sources. Dude, it's going to be, it's going to be, yeah, I'm really excited. I'm, uh, the most valuable thing that we can do, I believe, is share our knowledge, share our information. It's why I have always practice so really sharing the things that I have learned because I was able to learn from mentors and other people around me, colleagues, 
And I believe that everyone knows something that I would like to know. I may not know what it is, but everyone has some tidbit of knowledge or information that would be valuable or useful. And the, when we contribute to each other, when we share our knowledge and information, we all become better collectively. And um, there, there's also uh, an aspect of contributing and sharing with other people that really facilitates our own learning. Like my own learning has taken, in, in the last, I started now almost a year ago, in December of last year, I started writing a blog that uh, I try to post five days a week. I don't always get that accomplished, but uh, I target five days a week as much as possible. Of where I really wanted to take the things that I have learned from other people and write them down so that eventually I could organize them into a book or just to make the information available, widely available to people. And it's so incredible because I will write a blog post about something that I have learned and perhaps there are parts of it that are still unclear to me and I'll ask a question, have you observed something like this or what are your thoughts on, um, what, on this specific scenario? And I will get dozens of responses from people all over the globe. So my learning has become incredible. And the most, you know, there is this, uh, when you think about learning science, there, there's this science of how people learn the most effectively. And um, I'm just doing this from memory and the numbers could easily be off, but uh, it's something along the lines of when you hear something, um, you learn about 10% of it. When you hear it and see it, you remember about 30% of it. When you hear it and see it and actively participate with your hands or do something, you'll retain about 50% of it. But when you try to teach it to someone else, you retain 90% of it. You really learn something that you try to teach to other people. So that means that the most valuable thing that we can do for ourselves, even as Jonah, as you described, if, even if you're being very selfish, the most valuable thing you can do is share that information with other people because it will, you will get more information in return in exchange for what you share and you will remember it better if you share it with others. And, and John, like for me, when I discovered the power of sharing and, and why I created some of the projects that I've created was to facilitate that, that, the feeling of fulfillment and the, the joy and the, the satisfaction that you get in return from sharing that knowledge. You know, I believe it's how we're all meant to behave is, is that, you know, rather than it be all about me or me versus you and my information, you know, I'm going to withhold from you, man, you put that all out there. It comes back in ways that you can't imagine. You know, I've observed this really interesting trend where, um, over our history of consulting work at AEA, we have now consulted for thousands of farms. I, I don't even have an exact number or even a close number, but I know it's probably may, be, may even well be in the tens of thousands. And there is one common theme. When farmers, um, I'll, I'll share one example. We're working with a blueberry grower who had adopted a lot of regenerative agriculture practices and it was very successful. It, it was um, some of the highest quality blueberries that I had ever tasted in an experience. Very high yields, very flavorful, high bricks readings, a complete disease and insect resistance. It was an incredible case story. And he was here in North America a group of South American blueberry growers asked to come visit and to learn more about what he was doing. And he became very upset about sharing his information, his knowledge with the South American growers because they were competing for the same markets. And the South American growers had impacted his markets to the point where uh, his prices that he was receiving were, were a little bit less than what they had been in the past. And so his response was, he said, no, I, I don't want to share information. Um, I, I don't want to have them come visit my farm. I don't want them to know what I'm doing. So that visit never happened. And 
what was really intriguing to me was what occurred with this farmer and his blueberry crops after this episode. The quality and the productivity and the yields of his blueberries declined dramatically over the next couple of years. And um, he eventually, he is now going out of business. And there is no good agronomic reason for why this happened. Mm. So I believe, and, and I'm, this is an extreme example, certainly. Mm. But what I have observed, it is that it is those growers who freely share, they get more in return than they ever put out there. And uh, for those who are selfish, um, the crops reflect that. I can relate, man. I seriously can relate. And it reminds me of your podcast with, um, with Pascal, you know, getting intentional with, with what you're growing, you know, really being purposeful and giving purpose to not only yourself, but, but to, to, your, to your system as well. Since that conversation with Pascal, and actually even before that as well, uh, there have been so many uh, really incredible discussions where growers have changed their relationship with their crops. And rather than thinking about the crops purely in terms of economics of dollars and cents, thinking about these plants as cont contributing, to, um, contributing to the planet, contributing to people's health in particular, being food for people and having that type of a connection with the plants that they are growing completely changes the outcome. You know what? I, I, um, I shared with one of my clients um, for the first time, uh, a client that's not, uh, that was a really new client um, uh, of natural performance where uh, I, I just felt like there was a connection. You know, when you have conversations, you get to that moment where you're just with that person or with those people. And, and I was hearing, you know, stories of failed crops and things just not going well. And, and then I, I come in with a, I, I created a, a, a cover crop to suit this context and it's in the ground and the conditions are challenging and the paddock had been, you know, cultivated heavily and, and there was capping and things were slow to start. And right from the start, this, this particular client was, was, you know, was reasonably cynical and, oh, you know, it's taking a long time. There's not much going on out there. And, you know, you could just hear it that there was, that, that the intention was, was was not there that for the success of this crop and um and so I, I started talking about pascal and your podcast with pascal and how you know really getting intentional and 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 it's it's, it's beyond positive thinking you know this is really give, giving the plants a, an opportunity to contribute you know like 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 anyone in life you get given an opportunity because someone believes in you you know generally it works out really well and and what what I got back, you know, this this person sort of rolled their eyes. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, next minute we're going to be wearing the flax jandals and smoking cannabis out the back with the hippies, you know. <laughs> I thought, oh, you know, what have I done? And then I got a text a few weeks later, and the the crop um, had started emerging, and these this couple were driving past one of the one of the crops that were on a roadside, and and she went out there with her husband, this woman, and she said her husband said you know, come on guys, you can, re you can do it. And um, the crops now out of the ground and cranking. And these people are just like, is that coincidence? Or, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm believing it's not. <laughs> In the, we just posted a, the most in-depth course that we have ever done on the science and principles of regenerative agriculture practices on the academy. It's about, I think it's about 12 hours long of video, if I recall correctly, 25 different video sections. And uh, in this course, for the first time, I talk about the one characteristic that we've observed that is shared by all of our most successful growers, the growers who just have extraordinary financial and economic results and ecological results on their farm. And this characteristic that they all share is that they all have a deep empathy for the landscape. And uh, an empathy, we, when we think about empathy in a farming context, it, it's not uncommon to think about this context with, uh, or this frame with livestock producers, uh, particularly on dairy farms here in North America. Um, 
it's very common for, uh, we have the expectation that a good dairy farmer will be able to walk through a herd of dairy cows and say, there is something off with that cow. When there is nothing visual that you can see, it's instinct, it's this intuitive gut sense that there is something off with that cow. We think that's common or appropriate for livestock, but this same characteristic is also shared by all of the most successful growers with their crops. They will walk into a block of fruit trees and they will, they will use the phrase, they'll say, there is something off with this block. They may not be able to say what it is, they may not know what it is, but they have this intuitive, instinctive sense that something is not quite right. And when growers develop that level of connection with their plants and with their crops, that is when extraordinary things really start happening. And, um, you know, I think we have, we have lost this empathic connection with the landscape and with our crops as a result of two very important paradigms. Uh, and I'm speaking again in the context of a Judeo-Christian worldview, two very important paradigms from a Christian perspective that I believe are fundamentally wrong. And I talk about them uh, in some detail in, in the course. But um, the first idea is the idea that we are here to have dominion over. We're to, here to have dominion over creation that we are to dominate. And when in reality, when you look at um, what that phrase originally meant in the creation story and what it means in the original Hebrew, it means that we are here to be stewards of. We are to be stewards and we are to be ministers, not to dominate. But the second paradigm that I believe is at the foundation of, see, Actually, let me pause and back up for just a moment. In thinking about agronomy and plant physiology and why we have diseases and insects in our fields, what has really been foundational to our success at AEA is constantly trying to understand what are the source causes? What is the root cause? Why do we have powdery mildew showing up on some cantaloupe plants but not on others? And we can, when, once we identify the reason why it's showing up today, we now know that when you have powdery mildew showing up on a crop, it's because your soil has a microbial profile that is oxidizing all the manganese and your plants have a functional manganese deficiency because the form of manganese that they're picking up is not in the right form. That is the root cause, the source cause of why you have powdery mildew in the first place. And that is incredibly powerful because now it means that you have the information and the knowledge to prevent powdery mildew from ever showing up in the first place. And once you develop a library where you have identified the root causes of hundreds of diseases and hundreds of insects, um, that is really the library of knowledge that our consulting work at AEA is based on. You can prevent the problems from ever showing up in the first place. And so I applied this same type of thinking to try to identify what is the source cause? Why did we adopt the, these models of agriculture that are mainstream today that degrade soil health and that degrade water and that degrade the landscape? Why did we, what were the source root causes and why did we ever adopt them in the first place? And I believe that at the foundation of our mindset that allowed us to develop these types of agriculture were these two beliefs. This one belief that we are here to have dominion over, and the second belief that the land is cursed. So when mankind, uh, when Adam and Eve were driven from the garden, and there was a curse that was spoken out uh, on the land that it shall bear thorns and thistles and so forth and that a man shall earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. We have embedded this belief deeply into our Western worldview. And it is wrong. Because when we continue with the creation story, in Genesis 8.21, it God said that 
I'm used to reading this in German, so I'm translating it mentally a little bit into English here, but uh, my, my loose translation is, um, I will never again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. We've completely missed that. So that means that if we, if we are stewards of the earth or ministers of the earth, in a way that facilitates the development of disease, that facilitates the development of insect pressure, that facilitates the increasing intensity of weeds, we are coming from a place, we believe that that curse is still real and that it's true, and thus it is for us. Mm. That is a personal choice that we are making. We now have, um, in our work at Advancing Eco-Agriculture, uh, our systems are used on somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2 million acres here in North America. And I can say with complete confidence that it is possible for crops to be 100% resistant to all diseases and to all insects. And that is a very big claim to make. And I understand as a scientist that that is something that, um, you need, you need significant evidence for significant claims. And as significant evidence, I present 2 million acres of crops that have expressed incredible resistance to diseases and insects. Colleagues that I've worked with, I actually haven't uh, developed or haven't experienced this personally because it's not really a problem in regions that we work with here in North America. But I have a colleague who uh, described working with crops in Africa that were where there were swarms of locusts consuming all the crops for miles around except those that he had treated regeneratively and had changed the nutrition management the rest of the region was turned into uh, well you can imagine the locusts consumed every living thing and some things that weren't living except for these plants that were where the nutrition was being managed completely differently the locusts ignored them entirely that to me is an incredible, an incredible story, but it illustrates what is possible. It is possible for crops to be completely resistant to diseases and insects. It is possible for us, the land, the soil, our plants are no longer cursed. And it is possible for us to manage them in such a way that we don't need continuing fertilizer applications and pesticide applications to produce more food than we need to feed a growing world population. Wow, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're preaching to the converted here, man, but it's, it's still, you know, massively refreshing to hear the scale and the acreage that you're demonstrating the sign. It's fantastic. And so with that, John, I think it rolls on perfectly to the to the to the tail end of the the plant to seed podcast i want to hear from you john well firstly actually before we before i ask you this question i actually just want to take this opportunity to acknowledge you for your commitment and for your you know it's, it's courageous action out there man what you're doing what you know I'm, I'm hearing the amount of work you're putting into this stuff which i'm sure to you isn't work it's just what you do um, but I just want to acknowledge you, man, and thank you for, for who you are in the world and the difference you've made. Because for me, um, you know, you were one of the first person that I, that I reached out to after having created the, the Plant a Seed podcast to inspire people because you were one of my biggest inspirations and one of my, my biggest teachers, whether you realize it or not. For me, listening to your podcast, I, it feels like I've known you for so long, although this is the first time we've spoken. Uh, directly um well certainly in person uh, as opposed to email dialogue so i, I just want to thank you man and um and well, before, before before we continue i want to say that uh one you're welcome i appreciate the the thanks and the gratitude and secondly uh you are now doing your part of picking up the baton and spreading the message further uh all of all of us need to do that uh, even if it's just sharing with our families, with our neighbors, when we learn something that is really good news. Uh, no, you know, there's this saying that ignorance is bliss. Well, I would submit that if ignorance is bliss, then knowledge is responsibility. And now that we have knowledge, it is our responsibility to share that with others. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
And so what I'm going to leave everybody with today is I'm going to ask you the question, John, um, given your commitment, given what you're up to, what does the world look like in, say, 15, 20 years, um, given what you're committed to? Give us a snapshot <laughs> of the world and do it in, do it in, in, you know, nice, short, sharp. Give us a vivid image of what the world looks like to you. If you want to dig into it a bit more deeply, uh, I actually gave a presentation. It's on YouTube somewhere. It was titled uh, Agriculture in 2050, where they asked me to give a talk on what I see in the future. Um, so I, I went into some of it uh, in this presentation. I think some of the things that I talked about will really stretch people's imagination, perhaps well past the snapping point, uh, but that's good. So um, to answer your question directly, uh, I think what I observe happening over the next 20 years, um, by between now and 2040, uh, there will be significant, it's hard to make predictions because we live in an environment where there is such significant social change and societal change on such a significant level that uh, it, it's hard to begin, it's hard to imagine how all these pieces interrelate and interconnect. But what I expect, is I expect that many developed countries around the world will have a universal basic income. I expect that when we have a universal basic income, people will have the freedom to do what they desire, which has already been demonstrated in some social experiments. They will have the freedom to pursue their dreams. And when people have the, pursu the freedom to pursue their dreams, one of the most popular hobbies in the world, for good reason, is gardening. I expect there to be a resurgence of localized, regionalized agriculture and people producing food in their own gardens to the degree that they are able. Understanding, of course, that the majority of the world's population lives in cities now and may not have that capacity. I expect that uh, in the next 20 years, agriculture will be significantly disrupted by the development of advanced robotics. We now have um, robotics that can harvest a ripe blackberry without bruising it. So once you have fingertips that are that sensitive, you can now harvest any fruit. Um, when you consider the changes in the landscape that are implied by robotics and changes in labor and other things, it is possible to conceive of a landscape in 20 years from now that is even more dominated by large scale production, um, corporate, I don't like those adjectives, but uh, it's, it's possible to conceive of a landscape that has even less human empathy in the food production ecosystem. But I am imagining a future that is very different, a future where we have more people on the landscape, more people producing food that have an empathetic connection to the crops that they're producing and to the livestock that they are stewarding. And I believe that uh, inside of 20 years, 80% of all the agriculture globally will be conducted in a manner that regenerates soil health, sequesters water, or excuse me, sequesters carbon dioxide, stores water, regenerates local landscapes, regenerates ecology, and regenerates public health. This is, I believe, going to happen very rapidly as a result of economic incentives. That's what I wanted to hear. Not so much what's predictable, but what you're committed to creating, and that, that really sings home for me, that there. Well, thanks for having me on. This has been an enjoyable conversation, and, um, Thanks for the work that you're doing in sharing the word, spreading it, getting it out there, and um, carry on. I wish you all success and all blessings, and if there's any way that I'm able to contribute in the future, please ask. Thanks so much, John. I really appreciate your time, and perhaps we, perhaps we schedule a follow-up in, in a year's time and see how this, this new beast comes along. <laughs> well, it's a very loving beast, if you want to call it. <laughs> Kind harvest. All right, man. Hey, thanks so much. You enjoy your day. Thank you.